Amen. All right, good to be back. Amen. Amen. And uh, good to see everybody and see some new faces. <laughs> and uh, good to be out here in the promised land. <laughs> where there's no sin <laughs> or anything like that, like there is back in Ohio. Oh, yeah. and, uh, but uh, we had a good flight yesterday. And uh, I was supposed to go from Columbus, Ohio to Cleveland and Cleveland to LAX. But uh, I got to Columbus and they said that the plane, something wrong with the plane. And so I sat there for four hours. And uh, then the uh, plane, I said that my reroute you through Houston. And uh, so I said, good, I get to see my buddy, my hero, Joe Osteen. <laughs> So I had to stop by and see him on the way. And, uh, we, just, we talked and smiled together. Again. But, uh, so we went from Columbus to Houston, and uh, at least it kind of broke the flight up a little bit. Columbus to Houston is about two and a half hours, and then Houston to LA is about three hours. So, uh, but uh, we had a good flight and uh, good night's sleep last night. And we thank the Lord for the opportunity to be back, and it's good to see each and every one of you. And uh, I've been praying that God will do something great this weekend yes, David. Uh, yes, here in this church. And uh, good to see Pastor Kim and good to see Pastor Yancey and the folks yes. there and from the church and each and every one of you. And I pray that God will use me. I know that I'm nothing without God. Yeah, and right. I can get up here and yeah. blab all night. Yeah. But if the Holy Spirit of God isn't in it. That's right. It won't avail yeah. nothing. That's right. that's right. And so that's what we're praying about. And uh, we're praying God's perfect will be done. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. If you would tonight. Matthew chapter 26. I'll begin reading there in verse 36. Matthew 26. And I'll begin reading in verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little farther, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for Your Word. We thank You for these dear people here tonight. Lord, I pray that You would fill me with the Spirit of God tonight. I realize that I'm absolutely nothing without You, Lord. And Jesus, I pray that if there's a lost soul here in this building, that You would save them tonight before they leave here and get out on the roads tonight. Father, I ask for Your perfect will to be done in each and every heart tonight. There might be some Christians discouraged tonight. I pray we might be able to say something to encourage them. Yes. And Lord, I pray that like it's already been prayed, I pray against the demons of hell Amen. that would seek to hinder and to mess up this message and the remaining of this service tonight. Amen. Father, have full course here tonight. Amen. Full sway, we ask in Jesus' name. And Amen. 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 <clears throat> I'm... 
thinking this evening about all of the great men of God of whom I'm very thankful for down through church history in Bible times. I'm thankful for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and Solomon and Hezekiah. I think about Gideon and Joshua and Nehemiah and Job, Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. I think of Jonah and Noah and Daniel, John the Baptist, Peter, James, John, and the other disciples and apostles. I think about the Apostle Paul who wrote half the New Testament, yeah. probably one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. Sure. I think about Martin Luther and John Wesley and George Whitfield and George Fox and Peter Cartwright. I think about Savon Rolla who was burned at the stake for his mm-hmm. faith in Christ. Mm-hmm. I think about David Brainerd who died at the age of 29 years old. Yes, trying to reach the Indians there and died of tuberculosis a year many years ago. I think of Jonathan Edwards and D.L. Moody and Billy Sunday, Sam Jones and John Huss, yes, sir. Charles Haddon Spurgeon. But I want to preach to you this evening about a man the Bible says here in verse 39, and he went a little farther. I'm preaching tonight about a man who went a little farther. Yeah, amen. Come on. Now we know technically that Jesus went a lot farther than any human being ever went. That's right. But for the sake of the verse and the text that we just read here, verse 39 is my text verse, and he went a little farther. Yeah, that's good. I'm preaching tonight about a man who was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Amen. A man who came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I preach it tonight about a man who came into his own, and his own received him not. Preach it about a man who was at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. About a man who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. You know what guile means? There's so much guile today. Even in the body of Christ. Yeah. Guile is saying something and not being sincere about it. It's right. trickery. It's deception. Yeah. It's a, it's phony baloney. Preach that, brother. Yeah. There is so much phony baloney in society Great. today. Great. Yeah. Great. I'm preaching tonight about a man that when he spoke, he wasn't trying to fool you. Yeah. Wow. He wasn't trying to deceive you. He wasn't trying to pull the wool over your eyes. He wasn't trying to get a dollar bill out of you. Yeah. He wasn't trying to take advantage of you. Yeah, come on. There wasn't any guile when he spoke. Right. There was no phoniness about it. I'm preaching about a man who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. About a man who hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Preaching about a man who went a little farther. Amen. Yeah. Preaching tonight about a man who was wounded for our transgressions and was bruised for our iniquities. Amen. A man who was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he openeth not his mouth. <clears throat> I'm preaching about a man who was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. I'm preaching to you about a man who said one time, Marvel not that I said unto thee, he must be born again. Right. Come on. Preaching about a man who told a Samaritan woman at a will, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me a drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. You know what he's telling that woman? Yeah, come on. If you knew who I was, that's pretty he says pretty an arrogant thing to say. Not when you're God. Not when you're God. He was basically saying, if you knew who I was standing right in front of you, you'd ask me for that water, yeah, and right. you'll never thirst again. Right? Right. If you, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith that he give me a drink, because yeah. he just asked her for a drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, you would have asked me, and I'd give you living water. Yeah. You know why he could say that? Because he was God. Right. Amen. I can't say that. You can't say that. Right. But he can say that. Yeah. Preaching about a man tonight who told another man who had an infirmity for 38 years, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Amen. 
I'm preaching about a man tonight who told an adulterous woman one time, he said, neither do I condemn thee. Go That's and right. sin yeah. no more. What a Savior. Amen. What a man. He wasn't condoning her sin. That's right. But he said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That's right. I'm preaching about a man who said one time, for without me, you can do nothing. Imagine me standing up here telling you folks, I just want you all to know, without me, you can't do nothing. You say, what an arrogant preacher. What a proudful, egotistical maniac. Jesus Christ could say that and not even blink an eye. I'm preaching about a man when he was hanging on the cross said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. While he's on the cross, he said, Woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. He said, I thirst. And he said, It is finished. I'm preaching to you this evening about a man who the Apostle John said was the bread of life, the light of the world. The door of the sheep, mm -hmm. the good shepherd, Woo! the resurrection of the life, yeah, yeah. the way, the truth, and the life, yeah. right. and the true God. Amen. Yeah. I'm preaching to you that, about the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yeah, yeah. And I'd like to say several things tonight in this message that I've titled, He Went a Little Farther. Yeah. First of all, I want to say, number one, that the Lord Jesus Christ went a little farther when it came to sincerity. Yeah. I just mentioned it a moment ago. He was very sincere. Right. Now he did have, when I read the Bible, I find that Jesus did have a sense of humor. Right. One time he said about here, he said, go tell that old fox. Yeah. Right. I mean, and there's other places, you know. He said, go talk about casting the beam out of your own eye. You know, right. hypocrite. A beam. You know what a beam is? Right. You know how big a beam is? Yeah. Imagine that in your eye. That's, you know. I mean, he, he had a sense of humor. Yeah. Right. But he was sincere. Right. Amen. He was sincere. When I read of the life of Christ in the four Gospels and study His character and the way He conducted Himself and the words that come out of His mouth, I see a very sincere man. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, there wasn't a lot of phony baloney and foolishness with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with, with uh, joking around and that type of thing. I do that all the time, probably too much. <laughs> Especially with your Pope Kim right here. Amen. <laughs> Pope Kim of the Los Angeles Diocese. Amen. I mean, we act, we act a fool like that all the time with each other. But Jesus was a very sincere man. You look at you look at the, uh, the the sorrow here in verse thirty seven, verse thirty eight. He began to be very sorrowful here <clears throat> in verse thirty seven, thirty eight, and the prayers here. He's very he's very sincere. You say, well, yeah, uh, preacher, he's getting ready to get murdered. He's getting ready to be crucified. That's exactly right. This is his agonizing here in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. Very sincere. I believe that we ought to be sincere. We ought to be sincere, first of all, in our worship. Our worship. John 4, 24, Jesus said, God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. We need to be very sincere in our worship. Secondly, we need to be sincere in the way that we serve the Lord. Amen. Joshua 24, 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. Amen. Sincerity and in truth. Yeah. We need to be sincere thoroughly in our love for each other. Mm -hmm. we, need, we need love, have love toward one towards another. Yeah. Uh, here <clears throat> in this church and among born again Christians. Yeah. The Bible says... Uh, uh, Hereby perceiving the love of God because He laid out His life for us and we ought to lay out our lives for the brother. Amen. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word and in deed, uh, but, but in deed and in truth. There in First uh, John 3, verses 16 to 18. We need to be sincere in our love for each other. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, there is so much phony baloney yeah. in society today. The unsaved yeah. world. Yeah. And even in the body of Christ today. Yeah. We need to be sincere in our love for each other. I know you can't help everybody out. You can't do for everybody. But you need to be sincere in your love one for another. Yeah. Amen. Amen. 
We need to be sincere in our love for Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians 6.24 Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Right. You're looking at an extremist. <laughs> yes, sir. Did you know God's an extremist? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, you know what he said yeah. to Laodicea in church in Revelation 3? Uh, 16 and 17 in through there? That Laodicea church, he said, because I would thou were cold or hot. Yeah. Because thou art lukewarm, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. Yeah. Preach, brother. God is an extremist. Yeah. Before I got saved, I'm not going to go through all the filthy, ungodly things that I did. Yes, sir. I wish I could stand here and say that I didn't do none of that junk. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I could tell you tonight I got saved when I was five years old and served mm -hmm. God all the way through here, uh, through the years, and stayed by the stuff. But I can't tell you that. Yeah. I was 20 years old when I got saved. I wish I got saved when I was younger like some of these over here. Amen. I'm going to tell you what, young people, you're not missing a thing right. by Amen. not getting involved. Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell you what you're missing out on. You're missing out on a lot of tears. Amen. You're missing out on a lot of heartache. Right. That's what you're missing out on. You ought to thank God for that. Amen. Right. Amen. Don't let these people in society today try to make you think that you aren't up to snuff, that you're not really, that you're not really into it, you're not really lying. I am reaping today That's good, brother. things that I saw, heard, observed, and did 35 and 40 years ago. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. So when I got saved, I got saved, I just dove in. Right. I don't, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, but I don't understand these people who, they make a profession of faith. Yeah, come on. And for the next 20 or 30 years, you ever see people, they're getting ready to get into a swimming pool? <laughs> and they go out there like this. <laughs> Woo! That's cold. <laughs> they do that for two hours. <laughs> you know what I do? I just yeah. <laughs> and there's a big splash. Amen. 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 Yeah. I just dive in. Yeah. Right. Just a little dab of religion will do. You. Just a little dab. Uh, no. Preach, brother. No. Woo! no. I just dove in. Yeah. Before I got saved, I dove all the way in for the devil. That's right. right. And if I told you some of that, you'd say, yeah, you sure did dive in for the devil. Yeah. But after I got saved, I don't understand these people who, well, are we? Go they get up Sunday and they go, well, are we going to church today? Yeah. Oh, Preach, brother. Yeah. Hey. Huh? Are you going to church? Are you saved? Hey, yeah, hey, do you have the health? Now, if you don't have the health, that's another thing. But I'm saying, if you have the health, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you got a ways to get there? Yeah. Yes, you're going. Yeah. Yeah. I have never in almost 35 years of being saved. In June, it'll be 35 years. Like I say, in June 77. I have never got my wife and I, I've never gotten up and looked over my wife and said, Well, honey, <laughs> you think we ought to get our five kids ready? Do you, you want to go to church today? When the kids were at home, I never got up and said, Honey, do you think we ought to get up and go to church this morning? Mm. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> what? Yeah. You say, well, sometimes I don't feel like I don't feel like doing a lot of things. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. We have to be sincere in our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we've got to be sincere in the way that we conduct and behave ourselves. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 1.12 For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you were. Philippians 1.10 That ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. We need to be sincere in the way we conduct and behave ourselves. We ought to be sincere when it comes to our motive for preaching Christ. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> Philippians 1, 15 and 16, Paul said, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, right. supposing to add affliction to my bonds. 
Well, I want to preach Christ sincerely, don't you? Right. Amen. 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 The Lord Jesus Christ went a little farther when it came to sincerity. Not only that, but secondly, I believe the Lord went a little farther when it came to supplications yeah. and prayer. Here in verse 39, He went a little farther and fell on His face and prayed. Verse 42. Verse 42. He went away again the second time and prayed and said, Oh, my Father, this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it. Thy will be done. <clears throat> verse 44. And he left them and went away again. And prayed the third time saying the same words. He went a little farther when it came to supplications. That's right. And folks, if he had to pray, you and I got to pray. Yeah. 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 Hebrews 5, 7, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard of that he feared. In Luke 6, 12, in, in chapter 6 there, he was getting ready to choose his apostles. And you know what the Bible says that he did? He went out into a mountain, and he continued all night in prayer to God. Before you get ready to make some, well, any decision really, but especially we call big decisions, big major decisions, or any decision really, you need to spend time in prayer. And get God's mind on the matter. Young people, you do not want to miss God or the will of God in your life. The most important decision you'll ever make in your life, anybody, is getting saved. Amen. Amen. Where you're going to go for eternity. Yep. Mm -hmm. The next and most important decision you'll ever make in your life is not where you're going to go to college. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah, come on, <laughs> it's not where you're going to work at. Yep. It's who you're going to spend the rest of your life with in marriage. Amen. That is the second most important decision in your life. And you don't want to miss God on that. Amen. You don't want to run ahead. Yeah, come on. Let God work it out. Amen. God knows right where you're at. God has not grown senile. Yeah, come on. I'm not trying to be a smart way. But God, God doesn't God doesn't have, you know, he don't have some lapse mentally. Yeah. Right. He doesn't have Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> All right, and I'm not. I'm not trying to be. I'm just saying yeah. he doesn't. He knows exactly who you are, yeah. what you are, where you are. He knows everything about you, and he knows exactly. Watch this. Uh -huh. Who to put you with? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. To make you click. <laughs> if you get with the wrong one. You ain't going to be clicking very good. <laughs> right. That's right. You're going to be cranking. <laughs> if that's a word, I'm going to that's a word. Is that a word? <laughs> First Timothy 2 1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. You say, well, preacher, what if, what if I made a mistake concerning that? And, uh, you know, I, I've done wrong on that. I've been divorced. And, and uh, I listen now. You just go on for God. You, re you know, repent of whatever the situation, whatever your situation was, whatever things you did wrong, and you ask God for forgiveness, you go on and you serve God. Amen. And don't let the devil beat you half to death the rest of your life for that. That's right. And don't let other Christians or preachers make you think you're a second class Christian. Yeah. Preacher, Amen. brother. Yeah. You got that going on in churches too. Oh, yeah. He went a little farther when it came to supplications. Dr. J. Wilbur Chapman wrote a friend a, a letter which said this, I have learned some great lessons concerning prayer and supplication. At one of our missions in England, the audience was exceedingly small. But I received a note saying that an American missionary was going to pray for God's blessing down our work. He was known as Praying High. Yeah, yeah. Almost instantly the tide turned. Yeah, yeah. The hall became packed, and at my first invitation, 50 men Amen. received Christ as their Amen. personal Savior. Amen. As we were leaving, I said, <coughs> Mr. Hyde, I want you to pray for me. Yeah, he came to my room, turned the key in the door, and dropped on his knees, 
and waited five minutes without a single syllable coming from his lips. I could hear my own heart thumping and his beating. I felt hot tears running down my face. I knew I was with God. Then with upturned face, down while the tears were streaming, he said, Oh God. Then for five minutes at least, he was still again. And when he knew that he was talking with God, there came from the depths of his heart such petitions for me as I had never heard before. I rose from my knees to know what re real prayer was. We believe that prayer is mighty and we believe it as we never did before. Amen. 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 I'm talking about real supplications and prayer. Number three, he went a little farther when it came to submission. Here in these verses in our text, the Lord here submitting to God the Father's will and going through with the crucifixion is the greatest example of submission in the entire Word of God. Yeah, that's true. I heard a preacher say one time, the cross is, take up your cross daily and follow me. Jesus said, the cross is when your will runs this way and God's will runs that way, where they meet, that's a cross. <clears throat> We're to submit to one another. Ephesians 5.21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. We're to submit to the government and laws of the land. 1 Peter 2.13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be the king as supreme. You say, what if the government says something contrary to the word of God? We ought to obey God rather than men. Amen. Amen. 5.29. But make sure you've got scripture to back it up. Right. right. Wives are to submit to their own husbands. Ephesians 5.22, wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. I think every man in the world knows what that verse is. <laughs> but you know what I found out? I found out that I can make it easier for my wife to submit to me if she sees and knows that I'm submitting to God. That's good, brother. Amen. That's good. You know what's wrong in a lot of marriages? The wife is not stupid. The wife knows her husband. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And she knows if he is submissive to Jesus Christ. Right. That's good, brother. And if he is a rebel, it's going to create in her. Not only insecurity, but it's going to in confusion, but it's going to create in her like I'm not going to. I don't. I, I have. It's hard for me to submit to him when I see that he's a rebel against God. Right. Preach, brother. Is that the truth? Yes, sir. Yeah. All the ladies are going. Amen, preacher. <laughs> amen. He preaching it. Amen. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. Wives are to submit to their, to their own husbands. But I'll tell you what, it's a lot easier for women to submit to their husband if they see that man loves them, treats them right, yeah. honors them as the weaker vessel, 1 Peter 3 says. Honors that wife. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. Yeah. Ephesians 5.25 I'm to love my wife even as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for that church. I'm to give myself for my wife. How many men do that? Oh, preach, brother. You know what most men... I know it because I'm a man. You ladies don't mind if I preach to the men for a few minutes here, do you? Glory to God. You know how I know? You know how I know. You know how I know what I'm getting ready to tell you is true. You know what? What I know that most men, what most men think about, so. themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Their own needs. Me. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. How do you think He talks to us? Mm. How do you talk to your wife? 
How do you think he treats the church? You think he treats the church like... <laughs> if he did that, he'd zap me deader than a doornail. <laughs> the Lord don't treat the church that way. His bride. Amen. Some Christian men treat other women better than their own wife. Preach, brother. Preach. <laughs> Fellas, I'm going to tell you, man, we have a tremendous responsibility. Right. And I know we live in a jaded society today when it seems like everything is against the home. I'm going to tell you what the devil wants to do. The devil not only wants to tear up this church, he wants to tear up the homes in here. That's, That's right. right. Come on. That's right. I make it easier for my wife to submit to me if she sees and knows that I am submitting to God the Father. Right. And you know what? And there's been times I've been wrong and I've had to say to my wife, I'm sorry, honey, I'm wrong. You're right on that. Yeah. I was wrong on that. Yeah. Submit to the pastor that has the rule over you. That's right. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. <coughs> for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. Now, that doesn't mean that he's a pope. <laughs> I'd be joking around. Yeah. I'm not going to come down here and bow down to Pope Kim and kiss his little stinking feet. Hey, yeah. oh, I'm not going to worship him. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to idolize him. Yeah. But he does have a position that's to be honored. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Right, preacher. I don't think he does a very good job. I don't think a, you ought to try to get his shoes one time. <laughs> Preach out, brother. See how the devil attacks you okay. and your family. There's a there's a uh, doctrine of delegated authority. It's in it's in the Bible. Government over the people, uh, as far as the, the laws of the land and everything. You know, we're, when I when you drive down the road, it says sixty five. If you go 80 and the state trooper gives you a ticket, you can't say, well, I'm just going what I believe God wants me to do. <laughs> the California State Patrol trooper is probably going to laugh. Yeah. They say, well, you keep going what God wants you to do and you just keep getting another ticket. <laughs> Have a good day. All right. Government over the people. Christ over the man. The husband over the wife, parents over the children, employer over employee, and the pastor has a spiritual rule of the church. Spiritual rule. Yeah, that's right. Then we're to submit to God. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. To, to one who asked him the secret of his service, George Mueller. George Mueller had a bunch of orphanages. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's times that he didn't have any food at all for all these kids. He pray three and four and five hours a day. Right. Yeah, four in the morning. Mm -hmm. He pray, and all of a sudden people start bringing food right. to the place for these or for these orphan kids. Mm -hmm. He didn't have no he didn't have no money. Yeah. Come on. And somebody asked him the secret of the service. George Mueller said this: There was a day when I died, mm -hmm. utterly died. <coughs> As he spoke, he bent lower and lower until he almost touched the floor. He said, I died to George Mueller. Yes. His opinions, yes. preferences, taste, and will. Yes. I died to the world, its approval or censure. I died to the approval or blame even of my brother and friends. And since then I have studied only to show myself approved unto God. Amen. Amen. You know why a lot of you don't have any joy? Yeah, come on. Because you've never died. Right. Preach, brother. You say, die? What are you talking about? Die? I don't want to die. I know. Paul said, I die daily. Yeah. Yeah. First Corinthians 15, 31. Does that mean they had a funeral for him every day? No. Spiritually, I die in me. Yeah. I got a, I got a message I preach. Are you dead? 
And it does, I'm not preaching about being a deadhead Christian. I'm talking about, are you dead? I am crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20 uh, uh, Colossians 3.3 3, For ye are dead, yeah. and your life is hid with Christ in God. I got a sermon I preach. I use Romans 6 and 7. I got a sermon I preach, are you dead? Good. And I go through, you know what I do? I go through a bunch of things about a person who's dead. A person who's dead doesn't have any opinion. That's right. Come on. Amen. A person that's dead, you can't tempt them with nothing. Tempt them. Yeah. Right. You can put a glass of liquor, an alcohol, yes. whiskey, and a marijuana joint, a cigarette, and everything else, and tempt them with it, and they're not even tempted. Right. If you're dead, if you will die to self, a lot of this junk of the world will just go right on by. Right. Yes, sir. Amen. you got to die. You say, what do you mean die? Are you dead? I mean, I can't remember all the points to it. When you're dead, you smell Mm, that's good. Construction workers and utility workers out on the side of the road have they smell something? They go looking around. There's a dead body laying there. Somebody, some murdered man or woman, they've been laying over there for four or five days or a week or two. They say there's nothing more. What is the word? Putrid. Putrid. Thank you. <laughs> there's nothing more putrid. I, I was trying to think of a real nice, sweet word. <laughs> Thank you, brother Mike. Thank you, Mike. There's nothing more putrid than a dead body. That's why they embalm you. They get all the blood out of your body and lay your carcass six feet under. Because you and I stink. Yeah. Yeah. Stink. Flesh. Human flesh. A dead body stinks. Right. You know Paul talked about a sweet smell over there in 2 Corinthians 2. About putting off a sweet smell, talking about your testimony. I mean, that thing will preach. Are you dead? <laughs> die. Except the corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, Jesus said it abideth alone. But when it dies, it bears much fruit. John 12, 24, and 25. You know why Christians don't bear fruit? They don't die. Yeah. If you always do what you want to do, when you want to do it, the way you want to do it, <clears throat> How you want to do it, and you don't ever do what you're told to do. How are you ever going to have any joy? How are you going to ever bear any fruit? Yeah. Amen. Jesus died literally, yeah. and yes, He's born a lot of fruit. Amen. Millions Amen. and millions of souls have been saved the last few years. Amen. He's not asking you to die physically on a tree on a cross, yeah. but you got to die spiritually. Yeah, that's right. Amen. And you'll bear fruit. <clears throat> Number four, I want to say this. Jesus Christ went a little farther when it came to soul winning. Yeah, come on, pray. He went about healing and saving people all through His ministry here on the earth. Proverbs 11.30 says, He that winneth souls is wise. The word winneth there is like a military word. I used to live in uh, North Georgia, right outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee, Tennessee Georgia line, back 90 to 98. And uh, my wife and I are five children. And our kids went to the Tennessee Temple uh, School there, the academy there. It's, it's a little younger then. They went to the school there. We had them all in the Christian school down there. And uh, we could, from our yard, we could see Lookout Mountain. Civil War, when the Union Army come down there and took that lookout mountain from the Confederate Army from the South, there were thousands of dead soldiers laying everywhere, north from the north and south. But the North, the Union Army had to come down there and fight for that mountain, to win that mountain. And they did, but at a terrible cost on both sides in the 1860s. He that winneth souls is why. If you're going to try to win a mountain, if you're going to try to win a soul, you're going to have the biggest fight with the devil you ever saw in your life. That's good. Come on. Because the, this is a spiritual warfare. Yes, and a lot of Christians don't have any idea what you're talking about when you preach that. Yeah, I'm preaching yeah. right now. Really? 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 
Uh oh, Mom. Great. What's he talking about? <laughs> If you ever get sincere about trying to get people out of hell and go from going to hell and trying to win souls, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. I've been out knocking on doors, inviting people to church, passing out literature, trying to get people saved, and just about ready to win some man or some woman to the Lord right there at the door. And their phone rings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You say, oh, that's just a coincidence, oh. preacher. Me and another guy have been inside a house getting ready to win a man and a woman to the Lord and one of the kids falls and busts their head open. Right. Yeah. Yep. Anything to distract. Yep. Anything to stop conviction of the Holy Spirit and from a person getting saved. It's a spiritual warfare. Yes, that is. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6.12 The fight is a spiritual fight. I found that out as soon as I got saved. As soon as I got saved, in June of 77, all of a sudden I had these things in my head saying, you didn't get saved. You're not saved. You just went through a little little thing there and that didn't mean nothing. Everybody goes through a little religious experience and, and you didn't really get saved. I didn't have that before I got saved. Right. That's one of the ways you know you're saved. Yeah, this guy's right. a dirty rotten low down level. Never told me I wasn't saved before I got saved. Preach, brother. Now if he tries to tell you that you say, you dirty devil, I know I'm saved because you're telling me I'm not saved. <laughs> you didn't tell me that before I got saved. I mean, you need to go to the Bible about being saved. I mean, yeah. I'm, saying, I'm not saying you don't have feelings. Or I'm, yeah. I'm just saying, that's, in John 3, Jesus dealt with Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, a Pharisee. The next chapter, he deals with a woman who's been married five times and the man she was living with was not her husband. And the longest record we have of him dealing with anybody is that woman there in John 4. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> in John 8, the woman taken in the very act of adultery is brought to Christ. He dealt with all kinds of people. In John 9, he dealt with a, uh, he healed a blind man. The last thing he did on the cross was save a soul. Amen. 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 He saved the dying thief. He said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. In Luke 23, 43. Amen. While David Brainerd, one of the most celebrated of our missionaries, was laboring among the poor, ignorant Indians on the banks of the Delaware. He once said this, Brainerd said, I care not where I live or what hardships I go through so that I can but gain souls to Christ. While I am asleep, I dream of these things. As soon as I awake, the first thing I think of is this great work. All my desire is the conversion of sinners and all my hope is in God. Man, what a, what a saint. Amen. Live to be 29. Wow. We gave it all for God. Yeah. You don't know how long you got. That's right. You don't know how long you're going to live. Mm -hmm. While you're here, every day just give it all you got. Yeah. 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 He went a little farther when it comes to soul winning. We need to be more soul conscious. Yeah. Come on. See, when you see a human being. Yeah. I see my brother. I see these people. I see 50 million cars on the way here. <laughs> With 50 million people in them. Yeah. All right. They're all going here. They're all going there. They're probably going somewhere for the New Year's, you know, New Year's weekend here and, and uh, weekend, all this stuff, and vacation and all this. They all got plans and they all want to go all over the place here and they're all going to go all these things. But one of these days, they're all going to die. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's right. And they not only have a soul, they are a soul. You're a soul. Yeah. I don't want to go into a big, deep theological thing. I know your pastor's probably done it many times. But a soul has a bodily shape. That man in hell in Luke 16, the rich man, that he didn't go to hell because he was rich. He went to hell because he allowed his riches to stop him from getting saved. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
It says he died and in hell he lifted up his eyes. Yeah. So in hell they got eyes. Right. Yes, Being in torment so he could feel pain. Right. And he spoke, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. Mm -hmm. He could remember. Right. I got five brothers. Mm -hmm. So he got a brain. Some kind of a brain. Mm -hmm. He could speak. He had a tongue and mouth and vocal cords. He could remember. He could feel pain. He had all the senses. He could see. He could hear. He was talking. Mm -hmm. You have a body when you go to hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It never burns up. Yeah. Never annihilated. Yeah. That's right, brother. Torment and pain and, he and hell forever and ever. Yeah. Just as the saints who go to heaven when they die get a new glorified body, Amen. people that die and go to hell, they get a new body too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it never burns up. And so when you see a human being, I don't care what ethnic group they are. Yeah. I don't care what color of skin they have. Yeah. I don't care who they are. I don't care if they're from Mars or Jupiter. <laughs> if they're a human being here on this earth, they are a soul. Yes, sir. Yeah. Come on. And when you look at me, all you see is my flesh. Right. But I'm a soul. Yes, sir. This flesh is going <laughs> six feet in the grave. Uh, one of these days. If I don't get raptured out of here. Yeah. I'm going to expire and die one of these days. Yeah. They're going to take my body and put it six feet in the grave. But my soul departs the second I expire. Uh, yeah. And if you're saved, you've got something to defy the laws of gravity. Amen. You go up. Yeah. Yeah. But if you don't have Jesus Christ, you go down. That's right. He went a little farther when it came to soul in it. Jesus didn't care who you were. He didn't care if you were a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews, Nicodemus. He didn't care if you were a Samaritan woman who had been married five times. The man you're living with is not your husband. He didn't care who you were. He went a little farther when it came to soul in Dr. R.A. Torrey tells this brief but tragic story. One evening when Mr. Alexander and I, he said, were in Brighton, England, one of the workers went from the afternoon meeting to a restaurant for his evening meal. His attention was drawn toward the man who waited upon him, and there came to his heart a strong impression that he should speak to that waiter about his soul. But that seemed to him such an unusual thing to do. He just kept putting it off. You know how we do. We just get, yeah, just, yeah. you know, I'll do it later. You know, it's not that important. You know, he probably, he probably knows how to get saved. I mean, you know. <laughs> when the meal was ended and the bill was paid, he stepped out of the restaurant, but had such a feeling that he should speak to that waiter that he decided to wait outside until the waiter came out. In a little while, the proprietor, the owner, came out and asked him why he was waiting. He said he was waiting to speak with the man who had waited upon him at the table. And the proprietor looked at him in his eyes and he said this. He said, you'll never speak to that man again. After waiting upon you, he went to his room and shot himself to death. Whoa. See, you never know what people are going through. Yeah. See, you, you might think you know people in here. You don't know what, they're, what they got in their heart tonight. Yeah. People go around in church and they smile. How you doing? Just fine. But deep down in their heart, it could be crushing. Crushing. Paul said, The weak became I as weak, but I might gain the weak. And I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. 1 Corinthians 9.22 Fifthly, I want to say this. Jesus Christ went a little farther when it came to suffering. Oh, come on. And I don't need to really touch this. We know this. It's in the Bible, all through the Bible. But I mean, Jesus, I mean, he was beaten beyond recognition. Isaiah 52 14 says that his visage was so marred more than any man. You couldn't even recognize him. Matthew 16, 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes. 
It is estimated that more than 50 million Christians died for their faith in the Dark Ages. You know what the Dark Ages were? I am teaching uh, Revelation there. I just taught it in the, my home church. Now I'm teaching in another church. I'm preaching every Sunday in a church. They don't have a pastor. Uh, about an hour and a half from where I live. And uh, they want me to come and take the church. But I told them, I said, you know, I don't know. We'll pray about it and everything. And uh, I'm going there every Sunday and teaching and preaching three times on Sunday. And uh, I'm, I started the verse by verse studying the book of Revelation. But I taught it in my home church. Went through the whole 22 chapters. And uh, the Dark Ages are from about 500 A.D. to 1500. A thousand year period. Especially a thousand to 1500. You want to know why? Don't get offended. Don't get your little feelings hurt when I tell you this. Because the Catholic Church had a stronghold on the churches. That's why they called it the Dark Ages. There wasn't hardly any evangelism, missionary endeavors, souls getting saved, churches being started, because the Catholic Church didn't put up with it. They wouldn't allow a Bible-believing church like this. That's right. They'd cut his head off. Oh yeah. Thousands and millions. That's why they called it the Dark Ages. You say I didn't. I didn't learn that in the public school system in history and the public school system. I know, honey. You ain't going to. He has. That's right. Yep. The whole news media is pro-Catholic. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I watch Fox News. And I, I, you know, if you're going to watch any news, I'd watch Fox News. <laughs> but I want to tell you right now, there's a bunch of Catholics on there. Yeah, yeah that's right. I mean, Sean Hannity, praise the Lord for him. You know, he's trying to do what he can do. He's Catholic. <laughs> Bill O'Reilly, he's a Catholic. <laughs> Laura Ingram, she's a Catholic. <laughs> Most of them are Catholic on there. <laughs> now, if you're going to listen to the news, I suggest you listen to Fox News. You're probably going to get a better, more conservative type of a spin to it instead of the left wingers. Yeah, that's true. But I'm going to tell you right now, that's it's pro it's all pro You're never going to hear anybody on Fox News say anything negative about Catholicism. Here, here at Christmas Eve, you think they showed a Bible believing Baptist preacher in his church what he's preaching about? No, sir. No, they showed the Pope. Yeah. yeah. The Pope, and you know what his message was? World peace. Yeah. And we shouldn't have all these slaughters around the world and killing people. Holy baloney. Boy, yeah. That's right. Boy, what a great message. I don't get him saved, woman. Peace. Yeah, exactly. Boy, exactly. well, that put me under conviction. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's speaking to millions and millions and probably a couple billion people across the world and doesn't preach enough Bible to put in the left eye of a blind mosquito. Oh, yeah. Preach, brother. You think, now why would they, why would Fox and MSNBC and CNN and ABC, CBS, NBC, ABC, BBB, 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 and all those stations, why would they all show the Pope on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, him delivering his message, and not show Pastor Gancy or Pastor Kim in a Bible believing church? That's right. Why are they showing favoritism? That's right. Towards Catholic Church. For that matter, why don't they go to a Muslim church or some church? I'm not glad they don't. <laughs> why are they showing favoritism towards Catholicism? Yeah. Yeah. Catholic Church is about 1,700 years old. 325, 350 with Constantine. I wonder how many souls that religion has damned in 17 yeah. centuries. Right. Yeah. You say, you're offended me. i got Catholic relatives. My dad adopted me and my brother and sister. He's just like our real dad. I, I, we love him and we call him dad. <coughs> my real dad left when I was two years old. He was a drunk. <coughs> but my dad adopted us. I've been adopted twice. Amen. I got adopted by my dad in 1966. My name changed to Kobel. Yep. And I got adopted into the family of God. Yeah. Yeah. 1977. But my dad's whole side of the family are Catholic. And Grandma Kogel, she's been dead now for years. But she got mad because back in the 70s there, in the early 80s, the first few years I got saved especially, I got born again. I tried to get all my uncles and aunts saved. 
and I'd witness to them, Amen. and I'd send them little uh, uh, Christmas cards, and I'd put a, go a couple gospel tracks in them. That's right. That's good, brother. And I got word back. She never told me personally, but I got word back that she said that she doesn't want Steve trying to proselyte oh, her kids. Because my dad's the second oldest of 11 kids. How about that? He went a little farther when it came to suffering. John Huss, the courageous pastor of Prague, was arrested, condemned, and sentenced to be burned by a church council in 1415. When Huss heard his sentence pronounced, he fell to his knees and prayed and said, Lord Jesus, forgive my enemies. Amen. Then when he was chained to the stake, he prayed, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Yeah. Let me never be ashamed. Then flames snuffed out the life of the morning star of the Reformation. Mm -hmm. Amen. Martin Luther. I'm not talking about Martin Luther King. That's right. I'm, I'm talking about Martin Luther. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I'm not trying to be smart. Like, I'm just not, a lot of people think they don't understand what you're saying. I'm talking about Martin Luther back in the 1500s. Yeah. Yeah. Martin Luther was a Catholic. Mm -hmm. He got saved. He saw the light that a man is saved and justified by grace through faith. Amen. He got out of the Catholic Church and started the Lutheran Church. That's how it got its name, Martin Luther. Lutheran in the 1500s. You say, I never learned that in the public schools in church history or church history. I know you never will either. That's right. That's right. They've redefined history now. Oh, yeah. But, anyways, Martin Luther, and he nailed his 95 thesis to a church, Catholic church in Wittenberg, Germany. And he called the Pope your most hellishness. Uh, yeah. Instead yeah, yeah. of your most holiness. Yeah. It's pretty good. Martin Luther. Amen. The Catholic Church hated his guts. Oh, yeah. I know he had a few little quirks there. He, 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 he come out of the Catholic Church there. He still, I think he still baptized babies and sprinkled that type of thing. He had a few little hangovers from the Catholic Church. But I'll tell you what, he got saved. Yeah. He got born again. Amen. That was in the 1500s. Wesley Brothers, John and Charles Wesley, yeah. 1700s. You ever heard of the Wesleyan Methodist? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where it comes from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wesley Brothers, buddy. Now they believe you could lose it. They did. Mm -hmm. John Wesley believed you got to, you had to walk the line, but I don't understand how God can use a man that believes you can lose your salvation. It's all in the heart. Yeah. Yeah. Those men loved God. They were all mixed up on doctrine back in the 1700s. But they loved God and they walked the line. And John Wesley believed you didn't walk it, you didn't live it, you didn't go to heaven. <laughs> that's what he believed. Yeah. You say that's a heretic. Whatever you want to say, I'm just, I'm just telling you. But God used them, men. Yeah. That's Amen. Right. You know what that shows me? I'm not, I'm not condoning false doctrine, and I'm saying you might not be right on every little thing doctrinally, but if your heart is right and sincere, and you want to serve God and live for God, God can use you. Yeah. Amen. Hey, we all have to be perfect on everything. We God can use us. Praise, brother. You say, well, I think I'm perfect. You do? <laughs> Lord Jesus Christ went a little farther when it came to steadfastness. I'll just kind of touch this and kind of short here, but steadfastness here in verse 45 and verse 46 in our text. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray him. See the steadfastness? Mm -hmm. Judas is getting ready to betray him here. And then verse 47, Judas is coming forth there and kissing him. And uh, verse 49, he says, Hail, Master, and kiss him. And Jesus in verse 50 said unto him, Friend! I mean, this man just sold him down the river and Jesus is calling him friend. Yeah. Yeah. What a Savior. Yeah. Amen. 
Well, I mean, what a Savior. Yeah. What a man. Yeah. Hey, you want to be a real man? Study the life of Jesus Christ. Right? Yeah. You talk about a man. You say, well, could he lift? Could he bench press 550 pounds? <laughs> Did he go out and commit fornication 10 times a week? <laughs> no. That's right. You say, well, that's what Hollywood and the television tells me. That's what a man is. Oh, no, that's a wimp. Right. Yeah. right. That's a wimp. That's right. This is a real man right here. Amen. 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 This is a real man. Mm hmm. Jesus Christ. Amen. One little farther when it comes to steadfastness. Wasn't, he was stable. He was not wishy-washy. Mm -hmm. He said, I, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do in John 17, 4. He was steadfast. We need to be steadfast in the work of the Lord. Mm -hmm. We need to be steadfast in times of trial, steadfast during persecution, and steadfast in our convictions. Double-minded man is unstable in all, in all his ways. James 1.8 During the pastorate of Henry Ward Beecher, he was a pastor of the big church in Indianapolis, Indiana. Henry Ward Beecher preached a series of sermons years ago on drunkenness and gambling. And he slammed the men of the community who profited by those sins. Mm -hmm. During the ensuing week, he was accosted on the street by a would-be assailant with a pistol in his hand. And he demanded a retraction of some utterance of the preceding Sunday that Beecher preached. And that guy with the gun said, take it back right here, or I'll shoot you on the spot. You know what the preacher said in response as he walked calmly away? He said, shoot away. I don't believe you can hit the mark as well as I did. Ooh. Amen. 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 Talk about steadfast. Yeah. Yeah. Some of you might be going through some real trials right now. Come on, preacher. I know it might be easy for me to stand up here and say this, but I've been through some trials myself. All I can tell you is you just got to be steadfast. Yeah. Amen. Just got to stay by the stuff. Mm -hmm. Just keep right on going. Amen. Hey. Steadfast against false teachers. Steadfast in finishing our course. Paul said at the end, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I have kept the faith. Mm -hmm. 2 Timothy 4 7. When he said, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, he didn't say the course. It's not that there's a course, and it's the same course for everybody, the course. My course. From the time I got saved to the time I die, I've got a course. Mm -hmm. Brother, you've got a course. Mm -hmm. You've got a course. Ladies, you've got a course. We've all, young people, you've got a course. Yeah. My course, personal. And that's where you'll stand at the judgment seat of Christ for as a Christian. Yeah. How you ran your course. Yeah. You ever been to a golf course? <laughs> you start on the hole number one. And get out there and boop. I can't golf. <laughs> I crushed my hand back in 1980. I crushed that hand in an accident there working at Kroger Bakery in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, I can't even hold a club, golf club. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's sick. And, and I I, pre, I, uh, I golfed here about last, uh, 15 years ago, or whatever it was, 96 or 97, with a pastor in Ohio there. First time I ever golfed. A little smart like he got up there. He's, he, he's a member of a couple of golf clubs and all this. He got up there. He got up there. <laughs> Boom! They went about 300 yards. <laughs> I mean, you smart aleck. <laughs> I got up there. I can't even hold the club. I hit it, it goes 30 feet. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what, if you can lose your salvation, I'd have lost it that day. <laughs> I never cussed. But I'm going to tell you what, I got some mad. I was in the flesh. It was hot. It was in July. It was in July. I was sweating and everything else. And he was at like, watch me, Brother Cobble. <laughs> uh, I said, you smart <laughs> The only time I've been golfing in my life. But we had to start at the first hole, golf, hole number one. There's 18 or 9 or 18. And you've got to have a golf course. First hole, second hole, third, fourth, fifth, around 18. 18 holes of golf. You have a course that God wants you to go in your life. That's why you don't want to miss God on any move, right. That's good. any decision. Mm -hmm. 
However long God lets you live on this earth, however many decisions you've got to make, right. you want to pray mm -hmm. and get the perfect mind of God and the perfect will of God in it. Right. You'll be a lot happier. Amen. Amen. That's good, brother. A lot happier. Right. I'm about done. Listen to this. Lord Jesus went a little farther when it came to steadfastness. Let me just close with this. I'll just close with this. One day as I was fast asleep, I had this stirring dream. I was caught up to be with God, with angels it did seem. And while up there I met God's saints from many parts of the earth, now some were great and famous men, and some of humble birth. I talked to one great saint of God, the first one I had met. He told me how he died for Christ, his words I can't forget. He lived, he said, in Bible days, and died at Nero's stake. It was a joy to give my all and burn for Jesus' sake. I was so glad to die for Christ with humble words, he said. But as I listened to it all, I bowed my guilty head. Another man then gently spoke. Here is my story, friend. Twas cannibals that took my life because I would not bend. I tried to tell those heathen souls of Christ who came to die. They ate my flesh and drank my blood, but sent my soul on high. Of course, up here are millions more with stories rare and true. But friend, before I tell you more, let's hear your story too. Amen. I am ashamed of how I failed. I've known no sacrifice. I am ashamed of how I failed. I've paid such little price. I've never even given funds to send the gospel out. I've lived a life of luxury and never done without. Those costly cars, those extra clothes seem needless now and vain. The very thought of how I've lived now fills my heart with pain. Just then it seemed that Jesus said, Take up my cross today. I'll give to you another chance to work and give and pray. My guilty heart began to burn, my nervous body shake. Then I awoke with tear-filled eyes with new resolves to make. I told the Lord from that day forth my best, my all I'd give to win the lost in every place for this alone I'd live. I told the Lord that from then on I would not waste a dime, that I would give myself to prayer and really use my time, that I would seek with all my heart that power from above to help me tell a heathen world of Jesus' grace and love. I'm done. But I will say this. I preached a couple months ago in the Cincinnati, Ohio area. I preached there, I preached there every year for 20 years. And this man in his 80s, great, I mean, this man loves God. His wife loves God. She's dying of cancer. They're at the house. So me and the pastor go there. We went there a couple times when I was there with him in the meeting. And I don't know, she might be dead by now. I called, talked to her about two weeks ago. She was still hanging on. But they've lived for God for years. But you know what Brother Holbert told me? He looked me and my God given eyeballs. This is what he said to me. He's in his 80s. Got a nice home. Got a few material things. Tears streaming down his eyes, sincere as can be. He said, Brother Kogel, he said, Look at my dear wife in there, died of cancer. Been married for 60 years. He said, you know what? He said, if I had it to do over again, this is what he said. He said, I, 
her and I, we just got a little apartment somewhere. And all these material things. He said, I'd have given all my money to missions. He said, this doesn't mean anything to me. Looking around his house, he goes, what's this mean to me now? He said, this doesn't mean anything. I thank God for everything, but he said, this don't mean nothing to me. I'm not saying it's wrong to have nice things. Don't misunderstand me. God's blessed you with nice things. Praise the Lord. I'm not telling you to go live in a hut. (laughs) But this is what he said to me two months ago in October when I was there. Tears streaming down his face. He said, if I could do it over again, he said, we wouldn't have bought this big old house, beautiful home, furniture, beautiful furniture, carpet, all the little doodads. He said, it don't mean a lot. It don't mean nothing to me. Jesus went a little farther. Amen. Amen. That's right. Let's stand if you would.